Good morning, everyone. We gather this morning to celebrate the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time. At this time, I'd ask everyone to quiet any electronic devices and take a moment now as we prepare for our worship. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Lord Jesus, you were sent to heal the contrite of heart. Lord, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of good will. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you. We give you thanks for your great glory. Lord God, heavenly King, O God, Almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit. In the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who in the abasement of your Son have raised up a fallen world, fill your faithful with holy joy. For on those you have rescued from slavery to sin, you bestow eternal gladness. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Ezekiel. As the Lord spoke to me, the Spirit entered into me and set me on my feet. And I heard the one who was speaking say to me, Son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have revolted against me to this very day. Hard of face and obstinate of heart are they to whom I am sending you. But you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, and whether they heed or not, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that a prophet has been among them. The word of the Lord. The responsorial psalm. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy. To you I lift up my eyes, who are enthroned in heaven as the eyes of servants are on the hands of their masters. Our eyes are fixed in the Lord, pleading for his mercy. As the eyes of a maid are on the hands of her mistress, so are our eyes on the Lord our God, till he have pity on us. Our eyes are fixed in the Lord, pleading for his mercy. Have pity on us, O Lord, have pity on us. For we are more than sated with contempt, 
Our souls are more than sated with the mockery of the arrogant, with the contempt of the proud. Our eyes are fixed on the Lord, pleading for his mercy. A reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, that I, Paul, might not become too elated because of the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, an angel of Satan, to beat me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I begged the Lord about this, that it might leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. I would rather boast most gladly of my weaknesses in order that the power of Christ may dwell with me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus departed from there and came to his native place, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished. They said, Where did this man get all this? What kind of wisdom has been given him? What mighty deeds are wrought by his hands? Is he not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his native place and among his own kin and in his own house. So he was not able to perform any mighty deed there apart from curing a few sick people by laying his hands on them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. The Gospel of the Lord. It was a story of a boy who was born without a right arm. And of course, as he grew, he was able to use his left very well, but he was always self-conscious about not having a right arm. And he often blamed others for things, especially God for making him that way. His parents always tried to encourage him and do whatever they could. When he was about nine years old, they thought maybe if an instructor they knew who taught karate could help him, maybe he'd have some more confidence. So they brought him to the instructor. And the instructor said, sure, I can teach him. And Over and over again, he taught him this one move. And the boy said, but how can you teach other people other moves and you only teach me this one move? How am I ever going to win anything? This is a waste of time. I don't really want to be bothered with this. But the instructor convinced him that this was necessary for him. And that if he could practice this over and over again and get perfect at it, then he would show him what could be done. So the boy agreed and kept learning and mastered this one move. In a tournament, he started to win the first round, the second round, all the way up to the finals. When he got to the finals, though, he saw the opponent, a much bigger, stronger one, and he figured there's no way he could possibly win. But the instructor encouraged him, don't worry, win or lose isn't a problem, just do the best you can. Well, he came to the final tournament, and it turned out that he did win. And then he didn't understand, he said to the master, but how is it that I was able to win with just one arm? The master looked at him and said, see, I taught you one move, and I knew that this would be the best move for you because that one move, the only way to defeat it is for your opponent to grab your right arm. You see, there was a weakness that turned into a strength, a weakness that he didn't know was something that could be turned into a strength. And when Paul talks about God's grace being sufficient for us, we have to remember that. I'm sure every one of us at some point in our life has said, I wish I didn't have this, I wish this didn't happen to me, I didn't look this way, this, that, or whatever. And yet, does it really matter in the big picture? Because God's grace will get us through. Paul, though, if we remember in the beginning of this letter to the Corinthians, he starts by saying, so I wouldn't get too elated. 
here he's been charged with this wonderful thing. And I can imagine Paul thinking to himself, boy, am I doing a good job. So he had the thorn in the flesh that he calls it. No one's really sure what it was. Some suspect that maybe Paul was able to write great letters, but not very good in public speaking. And that maybe people often made fun of him. Maybe he stuttered or whatever it was. But I think sometimes God does use our own weaknesses. And if we let his grace work in us, then we let those weaknesses teach us how to be stronger. Whatever it is that maybe we can't do is okay, as long as we do the best we can with what we can do. You've probably seen some things on YouTube about inspirational speakers, some who may have been born without even arms or legs, but they didn't let that become a hindrance to them. Instead, they let it become a strength. And when they are the ones who are actually preaching, it's much more believable because what they're saying, you can imagine, is true. Because here they are, probably people made fun of them when they were little, growing up, things like that. But they didn't let that bother them. Instead, they let it, God's grace work in them so that they can now do God's work. Paul will continue to do God's work. We know it will end up costing him his life. Whatever that thorn in the flesh was, God told him that his grace was sufficient for him, and that's what we have to remember. There's a story, there's a movie called Simon Birch, and in this movie, Simon is actually a dwarf. And of course, you can imagine with all the kids being bigger than him, stronger than him, better than him, but he always believed that God had a special purpose for him, so he never gave up. And towards the end of the movie, as they're on a church trip, the bus that is driving is on an icy road, and the driver loses control and ends up putting the bus in the lake next door to the road. Well, it turns out that one of the windows is open just a little bit, but enough for Simon to be able to get out. He gets out into the water, and he is a good swimmer, and he's able to get the door of the bus open and all the kids out. There again, his weakness became a strength. God always will try to use whatever weaknesses we have if we let him to help us to help others. Now in this movie, Simon will end up dying, but while he's in his bed and his best friend is with him, he says, I know God always had a special purpose for me. So if I die, I die, but I know I did something to save others. And that's probably really what our whole faith is about because it was all about Jesus, who would have been ridiculed for saying the things he did. In this particular gospel we heard, it's because of their lack of faith that he's not able to accomplish many deeds. He didn't take it upon himself. He knew that God was working through him, but he knew that the others had to respond and respond properly. He doesn't become bitter or angry. He just continues on his mission to bring God's love and God's mercy to all he meets. Each one of us also has that same task. We are also charged with building the kingdom here and now, the kingdom that Jesus began. And sometimes I think we will look at our weaknesses and say, well, I can't do that. How many of us have thought maybe about doing something? To be honest with you, back in 94, when I was thinking about becoming a priest for the first time, I figured, well, if I'm going to become a priest, I probably should do some things in church that go, but no, that's not story. And there was an ad in my local church at that point, which took my home parish, that they needed catechists. Well, that ad went on and on and on and said, like, you know, by September something else. So finally, I figured, well, let me call. Maybe they don't need anybody anymore. Silly me, they always need catechists. But I ended up taking that on, and it was an interesting experience because in 94, kids were already starting to become, well, uh, difficult, um, even in religion. But those are things that I didn't think I could do. I don't like being in front of people. I never liked having to give presentations at work. In fact, when I would worry about one, I'd find that there's no point in worrying about it today. If any chance, you might die before you have to do it, and then there's nothing to worry about. The idea was to not let the worry overwhelm me. When the time came, just do, do the best you can and not worry about it. But I think all too often we're worried about what other people will think, what other people will say. We're worried about maybe messing up. How many times are we tempted in a class to cheat because we don't want to get a bad grade instead of studying to get the good grade? Well, that's another story. You guys would never do that, right? <laughs> I mean cheat, not the study part, okay? <laughs> There's also this other PBS special that I remember watching many years ago. It was called How to Be a Perfect Person in Three Days. And this boy was so awkward that he sees this ad and he says, I gotta do this. So he goes to the man who's running this little thing and he tells him, okay, yes, I can help you be a perfect person in three days. 
For the first day, tomorrow morning, when you wake up, you have to take a whole head of broccoli and wear it around your neck the entire day. So here's this boy going to school with this broccoli hanging around his neck. You can imagine the fun that was made of it. But he did it. Then the next day, he had to do another test. And the last day, the third day, his task was to do something he never thought he could do. He sees a contest for kites. He doesn't know how he's going to do it. He doesn't have anything. But he sees a beach chair and a man selling helium balloons. So he ties all the helium balloons to the chair, sits in the chair, and he is floated up. And it's the most innovative one. He wins the contest. He's completed his three days. He's now a perfect person. Well, the next morning when he has breakfast, just like always, he spills his milk and he says, I'm not perfect. So he goes back to find the guy that sold him this whole big thing about being a perfect person in three days. Well, the place where he was is now gone. He's already packed up shop. But he ends up finding him anyway. And then the man says to him, look, the first day you took a broccoli and ran around your neck and you didn't care what anyone thought about you. And then you did something you never thought you could do. You're never going to be perfect. But you can't let people keep you from being the best you can be. And I think that's what Paul is even telling us too. We all have something we probably wish didn't happen to us. We wish may not be there for us. But every one of those difficulties can be turned into a strength if we let God's grace work in us. And that's what God asks us to do, to trust in him, to have faith. Now, of course, in the gospel, Jesus says, it's because of their lack of faith that they were not able to, that he was not able to do many great deeds, only heal a few sick people. But I think we remember that, that faith is not just about believing that something can happen. Faith is not just saying, if I'm strong enough in my faith, everything will be okay. Faith is putting our trust in God, that even if everything isn't okay, we'll still get through. This world is broken and will always be broken. But God wants us still to do whatever we can to make it a better world. And that means sometimes to let go of our own fears, let go of our worries, let go of anything that's preventing us from doing something that we really think would be good and helpful. And that's what we have to remember. All too often, unfortunately, the young people, they'll end up doing something risky instead of something good to prove to someone else that they can do it. Well, we don't need to prove to anyone else. The only one we need to prove to is ourselves and let God's grace help us to be the best we can be. Many times, kids are bullied. And because of that, they let that get to them and they let that eat away at them. Instead of just praying for the people who are bullied, because almost everyone knows that a bully is someone who probably is not happy with him or herself. And that's why they do it, to try to make them feel better. But it never makes them feel better. And the worst thing we can do is to let someone bully us. Whether it's Facebook posts or whatever else you're involved with, Trust in God. Open yourself to God's grace. Remember that Jesus was willing to suffer and die for us so that we could have the hope of eternal life. And that's what our faith is based on. We can never lose faith in that. God's grace is sufficient for each one of us. It doesn't mean that we're going to be able to do things that we can't physically do or we can't mentally do. It doesn't mean that someone who might have mental limitations has suddenly become a genius. That's not what it means. But someone with mental limitations can still be the best they can be. And oftentimes, all that means is to be willing to help someone else in any way they can. Sometimes it just means being able to smile. Everyone can smile. You yeah, can all smile. You're not doing a good job, but okay, you can try it. God's grace is sufficient for us. We have to trust. And I can understand how Paul felt, because there are times when I can be sure that I just figured, man, I did the greatest job on something. And two seconds later, boom. And it's like, okay, God, I get the message. Because sometimes we think I did the greatest job instead of remembering that God did the greatest job in us. And if we can always remember that everything we do that's good is through God's grace, God's wisdom, God's protection, then maybe we'll be a little bit more like we should be, a little bit more like Paul realized he needed to be. The thought in the flesh, we never know what it was. But it was something that helped him to become more who God wanted him to be. God doesn't cause these thorns. That's the world. That's life. Whatever it is, whether it's we're born with some difficulty, born with some disability, end up with one later on, losing a loved one, whatever those things are, we can turn them into something positive if we let God's grace work in us. And that's what God asks us to do, to trust in him, to have faith, to never lose sight of all that the disciples went through because they trusted. They fell, but they were also picked up. 
Paul, at times, was a little elated. And sometimes if you even read some of his letters, you say, boy, he really thinks he's proud of himself, doesn't he? But every now and then, God would remind him. Now, I know your story, the story about Paul's conversion, being Saul, the idea is that he was knocked off his horse. We don't know if he was actually on his horse, but it's probably a good image to remember. He was knocked to the ground, but he let God pick him up, and he let God walk with him for the rest of his life. Together now, let us profess our faith. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father, through him all things are made. For us, men, and for our salvation, who came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, and suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray and hope for God's guidance and encouragement as we seek to do Christ's will. Our response is, Lord, hear our prayer. For our parish, that we may open our hearts and minds to the presence of Christ in our midst, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. For preachers and teachers of the gospel, especially for missionaries and catechists, we pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord hear our prayer. prayer. For those elected to offices of public trust, that they may work for true justice and liberty throughout the world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all the sick, especially Marie Delia, and for those who are suffering in any way, that they will be touched by the healing power of Christ and be returned to good health, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the faithful departed, that they may rest in peace and rise in glory, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions in our prayer intention book, and the prayers we keep in our hearts, and for Barbara Elizabeth Dillon, for who this Mass is offered, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. God, our Father, you have sent your holy word into our midst through your Son. Open our hearts and minds to his message. May we follow him despite our weakness. We pray in his name, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Yes. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May this oblation dedicated to your name purify us, O Lord, and day by day bring our conduct closer to the life of heaven, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For you so loved the world, that in your mercy you sent us the Redeemer, to live like us in all things but sin, so that you might love in us what you loved in your Son, by whose obedience we have been restored to those gifts of yours, that by sitting we had lost in disobedience. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give you thanks as an exaltation we acclaim. Holy, 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 holy Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the death of the Lord until you come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope, and John our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles, 
and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant your peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only a favor of my soul shall be eaten.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, O Lord, that having been replenished by such great gifts, we may gain the prize of salvation and never cease to praise you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The only announcement for the week is to remember to take a bulletin when you leave Mass today. And I found out that after you finish reading the bulletin, if you fold it in half, it makes a very good fly or wasp squatter. <laughs> the Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.